As one of the earliest lectures in this mini course around Master Your Brain, there are a whole series of things that you should know that you may not know about your brain. Your brain does a whole lot of stuff for you, but it's also doing a whole lot of stuff to you. And some of these ideas will at least give you a deeper understanding of what's happening. So two objectives really here I have for you. One is to be more appreciative of both the complexity and the magic of our brains. They really are the most complex things known to man. And to raise your awareness of what your brain, as I said before, might be doing with you, behind you and against you. This is happening all of the time and we think we are our brain, but in fact we are only a small expression of what's happening inside of this uh, magic thing behind our eyes. So a few things about the brain that start to set the scene. This complexity is underpinned by the interconnectivity of the nerves in your brain. So while we have somewhere around about 80 billion nerves in our brain, a massive number, each of those actually have about 7,000 connections with other nerves. These connections are called synapses. And it's this interconnectivity, this massive parallel interconnectivity that makes the brain so complex. It also gives the brain its massive potential. It's very volatile. 100% of the time our brains are changing. Now, we used to think that our brains were fixed. And obviously we understand that the child brain would be massively changing all of the time. But as a result of watching this lecture, your brain will change. Your brain should be changing on a daily basis with all of the new things that you acquire. We tend to think that because we're inside our brain, we know a lot about our brain, but in fact we know so little. Some neuroscientists suggest that up to 95% of the operation of the brain is inaccessible to us. It's below the level of consciousness. So this is stuff that's largely outside of our ability to control and command. Our brain is a very demanding organ. It only comprises about 2-3% to of our body weight, yet it consumes 20-30% to of our available resources energy. It's just simply an expensive organ to run. It's absolutely unique. Zero are the number of other brains identical to yours. There is no other brain on this earth, nor has there been, nor will there be, like yours. Your brain is absolutely unique. That means that nobody thinks like we do. And yet we often make this assumption in the way that we work with people. We, we think and we feel that people are with us. But in reality, how we think, how we feel is entirely unique. And the last idea here for you is the degree to which our brains are socially oriented. Neuroscience is suggesting that roughly 90% of the operation of the brain is oriented to is oriented to social situations. And this actually catches us out sometimes. We think we're very strong individuals, but so much of what we do unconsciously and consciously is built around those around us. It's probably useful to, at some level, be aware of the base unit of the brain. And what you see here is an illustration of a synapse. A synapse is where two nerves actually come close together but don't actually touch and they communicate through a vast array of different chemicals called neurotransmitters. So when a neurotransmitter travels from one synapse to another, this in effect creates a nerve impulse. And these happening all of the time right across the brain create the net effect of all of the things that we know about the brain, those conscious and unconscious activities and circuits that are going on. So if that's the base unit of the brain, let's look at some numbers. Now I know in the last slide I told you don't think about the brain as a computer. And what am I going to do now? I'm going to compare the brain to a computer. So just from a point of view of understanding a system and some measurements we might know and to give you a sense of the scale of the brain. So we have 80 billion neurons, each with up to 7,000 synapses. And what this equates to is about 1,000 terabytes of storage in the brain. Now again, I'm not saying we have it like a computer, but the equivalent sense of what we can hold in the brain gives you an idea of its capacity. Now I've got a four terabyte hard drive. It's quite a big portable hard drive. I could have 250 of those four terabyte hard drives 
in my brain in terms of the capacity of storage. Now a computer tends to run at about 100 watts, some less, some more. Our brain runs on about 10 watts of power, so that's about an LED light bulb. Now interestingly, in comparison to a computer, the brain is very slow. It has 1,000 operations per second, which is millions of times, tens of millions of times slower than a computer. But what we have in our advantage is where the magic really lives. This is a cubic millimetre of a mouse brain. So the magic emerges then from the close adjacency of so many different nerves and their synapses. This is how the brain can actually pack so much into a small space. So packing so many nerve cells so close to each other in this sort of jumbled spaghetti-like structure means that the interconnectivity between different nerve cells can run at parallel. We can have lots of things happening all at the same time. So it doesn't matter that the brain is much slower than a computer because we run not in a serial sense like a computer does, one after the other, but in this massive parallel operating system. This is where the real magic in the brain occurs. One outcome of all of this is that neurons that fire together wire together. This means that when we get a neural network all firing together, this strengthens over time. And in fact, your habits, the things you can do physically as a habit, the things that you think as a habit, these habits are the result of lots of these neurons firing together, if you like, triggering at the same time and strengthening their interconnections. Things that don't fire regularly get pruned. So when I don't use a new Chinese word that I learn, represented by a series of synapses that have been formed, then the brain will prune that sometime after a week or two. So that's why we tend to forget things. We know we've learned them, but we can't recall them because the brain's already pruned that connection. A tree is a really nice metaphor of the brain. The existing strong neural networks we have are like the branches and the twigs. And new learning can only occur on those twigs and branches. Those buds and leaves that appear in spring on the existing branches and twigs are metaphorical of the new learning that we have. So this means that new learning happens best when it's at the edge of our existing knowledge. This idea is very much about being aware of what your brain needs. I've already said that it's a very demanding organ. It uses a massive amount of our body's resources and available energy. The metaphor here is it's a bit like going for a marathon. If you are a marathon runner, and I'm not, then you'll know that you need to be in peak condition and you need to supply resources to the muscles for you to perform in that particular environment. Similarly for the brain, we need to perform well on a daily basis. I often say it's a bit like running a marathon for your brain every day. And to do that, we need sleep. Sleep is one of the most significant inputs to good brain operation. And now we're beginning to understand more about the value of sleep. Not only does it help us work through our cognition, consolidating memory and understanding from the day before, but it cleans the brain overnight of the toxins that come from all of the metabolism that's going on all of the time. And these are just two elements of the importance of sleep on our brain and cognition. It also impacts on our ability to be resilient, both from an emotional point of view and from an immunity point of view. Hydration is incredibly important for the brain. If we become dehydrated, the brain becomes unable to run some of its metabolic processes. And similarly, nutrition is a massive part of our brain. Nutrition is critical. And if you eat badly, your brain's not gonna work as well. And we know poor diet leads to long-term issues, brain degeneration over the period of our life, particularly when we get older. Exercise is another need our brain has. Some suggestions are that we evolved exercising and problem solving on the plains in the savannah when we were much more primitive than we are now. And to survive in an environment where we were a relatively puny and weak animal, we needed to be able to think on the run. So this ability to move and think is important. Improve your cognition, improve your exercise. Lots of research to support this idea. A couple of other quick ideas too. We are very social, as I mentioned before, so therefore we have social needs. Mindfulness has a big impact on the efficiency of your brain and its ability to work through 
thinking and emotion and stay on task and manage attention. And stimulation, novel stimulation. Our, our brains demand new things all of the time. This is one of the reasons why travel is so impacting on our brain and so rewarding to our brain. It provides us with new environments, new sights, new experiences. So to wrap up this idea of introducing you to your brain, I'd like to suggest maybe a few books. Now there are a load of good books and I could put a, a series more and on our Facebook page I may put some more for you to read. But at this stage, a couple of interesting ones. David Rock's work is always insightful and gives you a wonderful understanding of how your brain works in various situations. Your brain at work is excellent from that point of view. For me, Brain Rules gave me a deep understanding of um, the operation of the brain in a number of different circumstances and introduced me to a lot of the concepts that I've given you here. Adam Gazali is one of my heroes. He, he is at the edge of technology, neuroscience and medicine and it's a very interesting space in which he plays. And his book, The Distracted Mind, really speaks to this idea of this ancient brain we've got in a modern world and how many distractions we've got, the impact of our modern world on our ancient brain. Earlier I mentioned Norman Doidge's book, The Brain That Changes Itself, a fascinating story and underpins this idea of how, how your brain can change over time. And Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow gives you an insight into the different thinking systems that we have inside of our brain and I'll reference his work in some of the other lectures to come.